Is it, is it working? Yep. Okay. So, so uh, this is the third part of the workshop now, and we're going to talk about um, uh, length scales and time scales of uh, coupling surface and, and tectonic processes. Uh, there are two talks now. Uh, it's going to last half an hour and 15 minutes question. Then we're going to get a break and another talk after. Okay, so they're all going to talk about this. Uh, I think this, this talk especially uh, going to talk about this uh, problem of scales and land scales and how much do we need to resolve to looking at different problems, di different geological problems. So the first talk is by Jean Arthur Olive. He comes all the way from uh, L'Ecole Normale et Supérieure. Uh, uh, and his talk is about feedbacks between brittle deformation and surface processes inside from extensional settings. So go ahead. Thanks very much, Luke. And uh, I want to thank the, the committee for inviting me to uh, pretty much share my journey from a geodynamicist slowly becoming a geomorphologist, or at least a, a partially coupled geodynamicist and geomorphologist, however you want to call it. Um, of course, this is not a uh, solitary journey. I started this during my PhD. Um, with Mark Vane, continued during my postdoc with Roger Buck, and this is what I'm continuing to do now with uh, Luca Malatesta, who's a real geomorphologist. And uh, Paul Betka has been very helpful in taking us outside to look at rocks and not just look at the model. Um, and I also want to acknowledge support from NSF for this. So I want to talk about brittle deformation and how it interacts with surface processes, but let's kind of frame the picture a little bit. When I'm talking about brittle deformation, I really mean what's going on in the upper palmetto crust, where the temperature is pretty cold. You don't have um, significant viscous creep. Things happen mainly through either extremely localized deformation when you break uh, faults, or in a more distributed fashion when you have broad scale uh, flexure or broad scale isostatic readjustment, for example. And in particular, I want to talk about the feedbacks between surface processes and the dynamics of brittle strain localization. But as you'll see, and as I hope I'll convince you, um, you can't really treat strain localization in isolation from all these other processes of distributed deformation. So when we think again about surface processes and strain localization, something that keeps coming back in a lot of uh, numerical models is this idea that surface processes generally promote uh, strain localization. That means that if you run a, um, for example, an evolutionary wedge model or rifting model, what you generally find is when you rework the surface in steep intensity, um, it helps promoting deformation on fewer, longer-lived faults, right? This is something that comes back in a lot of uh, numerical models. So what I really want to get into today is what are the physics that underlie these feedbacks kind of in detail? Um, what might make a particular tectonic system more sensitive to the growth of its own topography and or the removal of its own topography? And then from the surface process side, when are surface processes efficient enough to really alter um, the landscape sufficiently to have a tectonic impact. And finally, as we were discussing in the breakout groups, can we find some evidence or indication for such modulation in real landscapes? For this, I want to focus not on convergent boundaries, but on uh, rifts and half grabbins in particular. And I view them kind of as really great natural laboratories to study strain localization in relation to the broader upper crust deformation. This is a large scale cross section through a section of the Bayesian range in Nevada. The upper crust is about uh, 12 kilometers thick, as indicated by the depth, um, the maximum depth of earthquakes. And you can see that although this is a diffuse, very wide rift, much of the tectonic action happens on three major master faults that bound half graben structures. We have three here. Um, so most of the topographic relief and structural relief happen through a high degree of strain localization in extension. If we zoom in on um, one of these, the Wasok Range in Nevada, but well, we pretty much have all the ingredients needed to say something hopefully interesting about the feedbacks between the surface and the deeper deformation. What I mean by that is we have a, a system where most of the strain is taken up on the master fault. Um, slip on this fault creates a foot wall block that uplifts, creates a range, and subsidence in the hanging wall creates a basin that gets filled by sediment. Here it's covered by a lake. And you can see right away that um, this is a fault on which the total slip has been estimated to be of order almost 10 kilometers. And yet the relief you've created was only about a kilometer from um, lake to drainage divide. So a significant amount of mass has been removed as the system was growing. And it's always interesting to contrast that with other settings. For example, at a mid-ocean ridge, if you had a, a normal fault that was growing for 
with such a large offset, with limited reworking of the topography, it wouldn't look anything like that. It would actually expose and preserve most of the football into a dome or oceanic core complex. So just these simple kinds of thinkings lead you to realize that reworking the topography must have a sizable impact on uh, the tectonic evolution. All right, so to get a little bit deeper into um, the feedbacks that might happen between topography evolution and fault evolution, a few years ago, we um, coupled a geodynamic model with a simple parameterization of surface processes. So we took the code that I developed during my PhD, Fisker, simple scope solver with exotic rheology, available um, online, you can download and play with it on GitHub. It solves all your favorite conservation equations in a viscoelastic um, continuum. But the key is that it localizes faults spontaneously whenever the stress state is uh, right for it. So when you meet the Morphoulon threshold, um, you have a scheme that allows local weakening that creates a shear bend that leads to a fault. Our model setup was fairly simple. We did a perfectly elastic plastic brittle layer of a known thickness. We initially seeded a normal fault at an optimal tip, and we just asked the question, what happens if we just pull on the system and let it develop topography? The topography is handled through a traction-free surface. We actually have a whole air layer, a very weak air layer, um, that we're um, actually including in the model. But in a very simple, you know, first-order kind of way, let's just put a fault, pull on it, and look at kind of what kind of topography we get and how the fault evolves. Does it stay stable? Does it keep growing? Or do we break a new fault? We did this, uh, coupling it with a simple set of uh, topographic evolution rules. The first step is to erode material at a rate that scales nonlinearly with the local slope. So we take away material. And the second step is to uh, take all that mass that's been eroded and deposit it flat in the corresponding watershed. So we have a local mass conservation basin, which leads to basically whenever you create a football high, you take away a, a good chunk of the mass and deposit it in the corresponding slope. So you do that kind of spontaneously and self consistently. And the one knob that you can turn is the overall efficiency of surface processes, for example, through the reference to the erosion. So here are three snapshots that synthesize uh, our finding. This is for a paper we published four years ago, where um, this is the simple exercise of pooling and uh, imposing 20 kilometers of extension on our perfect elastoplastic layer over an invis uh, almost invisible lower crust. And this is a case with very inefficient erosion, very slow erosion rates. And what we found is that the initial fault that we had seeded here, number one, grew, accumulated maybe a couple of kilometers of uh, slip, and then was abandoned in favor of a new fault here, number two, which was actually uh, empathetic. And this fault accumulated some slip, and then it was then itself abandoned in favor of this newest fault that is presently active at the time of the snapshot. We did this again and again, increasing the erosion rate. By the way, this is for a 15 kilometer thick elastoplastic upper crust. And what we found is that if we could uh, have surface processes efficient enough to level the topography, our initial fault, number one, was actually pretty happy um, this way, and it just kept growing and growing, creating more topography and more topography and growing the basin. So this is this basic effect of strain localization being promoted by efficient surface processes. The other thing we did is repeat this experiment with different um, rheological parameters, and mainly in a really simple way, varying the effective thickness of that elastoplastic layer as a proxy for its integrated strength. So the cases I showed you before, here I plotted on this plot of the initial fault lifespan. That's how much offset was I able to build up on my initial half grabbin before it was abandoned in favor of a new fault. Versus a proxy for the efficiency of the erosional processes, my reference erosion rate normalized by fault slip rate. The runs I just showed you actually plot along this um, red trend here, where if you have very inefficient erosion, this was the top snapshot, uh, an initial normal fault only grows maybe three kilometers and then dies. As you increase the erosional efficiency, you increase the lifespan or the total offset you can impose on a fault all the way to infinity in this case, where you can have a half grab and it's happy to grow um, indefinitely. But if you repeat this experiment, not in a 15 kilometer, but in a 25 kilometer thick um, layer, so much stronger from an integrated strength point of view, you do get the same kind of um, promoting strain localization effect, but it doesn't ever get you to faults that live forever. It actually only prolongs your lifespan from about three kilometers of offset to 15, which is still pretty good. It's a sizable impact, but it doesn't get you to infinity. So that tells you that the integrated strength of the system has some effect on modulating the intensity of topographic feedback. So that's where we were about um, 
about four years ago, and we decided to kind of dig, dig a little deeper into the physics. And to do this, it's always nice to go back to very high school, you know, basic high school physics, just to kind of set the picture. We're thinking about how energy is partitioned into the system, but a, a simple way of presenting that is, okay, let's consider if you block on the inclined plane, you wanna take it from initial altitude zi that, um, all the way up to z final, and you're asking, well, how much energy does that take? You can think about the block's mechanical energy as a kinetic component, we'll ignore it because it's so slow in our world, and there's a potential energy, a gravitational energy. If you wanna move this block up to a new state, you have to push on it, right? You have to supply some external energy into the system. And a classic conservation statement tells you that the change in mechanical energy will be the sum of the work of all the dissipative forces. So what that, that's telling you is that the external work you have to supply to the system needs to counteract the work uh, that's dissipated by friction at the block plane interface. If you reshuffle these equations very slightly, at the end, you can write the total work that you had to supply that me, the uh, outside observer, outside actor had to supply to the block um, to get it to its new state. And that relates to the change in gravitational potential energy and the um, friction, or more generally, the work um, that was dissipated by all kinds of dissipative forces. This is in high school, so we need to uh, take this to a slightly more intense level, but you can pretty much do the same uh, type of argument in the continuum. This is just a simple force balance uh, statement divergence of um, stress plus gravity equals zero. If you're familiar with uh, finite element code, you do this kind of thing all the time, you formulate it in weak form. What that means is you take this force conservation statement, multiply it by some displacement field, right, that represents the motion of material through your crust. You integrate that over the volume, do a little bit of a vector um, tensor calculus magic, and you end up with um, this form of the equation. So this uh, stress term now ends up split into Two terms, something that has to do with the boundary attractions, and you can think of that as the far field tectonic forces on the system. Um, but it also has to do with this term um, that is linked with the gradients in displacement, and the gravitational potential energy term appears here. So let's go through them real quick. This is exactly the same analogy, well, this is analogous to what I was doing with the little block on an inclined plane. This is what you would consider the external work from the far field forces applied on the edges of the domain. This is the gravitational potential energy term, that's the work of gravity. And this is the dissipation of the internal work that's done through uh, internal deformation. This is gonna have two components, actually. So if you think about the most generic modes of deformation in the upper crust, like I said, there's a very distributed kind of folding, flexing, and there's very localized um, slip on the fault. And that is something that can actually be handled by that term. Because you see, it doesn't relate to the displacement field U, it relates to the gradient in displacement. So anywhere where you have strain, you can be integrated times the internal stress. So part of that gradient might be really sharp, really, really sharp gradient in the fault. That's localized deformation. That's the friction on uh, fault interfaces. And another part is just dissipation through, for example, elastoplastic bending over longer uh, length scales. Now the gravity work is also quite interesting. It's basically the integral of the vertical displacement um, over the area of the system in consideration. You can, again, kind of split it into two terms. This first term here that has to do with integrating the vertical motion um, across this entire area, like the bulk, the inside of the crust. And this is a case where over some length scale, all the uplift will eventually compensate all the subsidence. So a lot of that might actually balance itself out. But as you get closer to the surface, there's another component to this term that has to do with pushing gravity up, uh, pushing topography up and uh, pushing basins down. And this actually sums construst constructively in this case, because here you've got positive uplift driving positive topography, negative uplift driving negative topography, plus plus minus minus is all plus. Um, so that's essentially the term that uh, is linked to topography. And that's pretty much the, the heart of the feedbacks with surface processes, because that's the part where you're sensitive to external reworking of uh, the relief. And finally, the external work, like I said, has to do with the far field forces you exert on the system. How much energy as uh, an exterior uh, driver do you have to supply to your upper crust to uh, keep it deforming, to keep it going? It's easier to think in terms of forces, at least for me, than in terms of work. So for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on uh, force description. 
instead of saying that the work is the integral of the force along the path, I'll just say the force is the derivative of the work that we're doing, either shortening or um, extension. And the point is that this external force that you have to supply to the system to kind of keep it going changes as you flex the layer, as you create new faults, as slip accumulates on a fault. So if you start applying a force on the system and you want to keep it deforming and doing lovely tectonic things, you have to supply more and more force. But part of that force actually has central energy component and part of it has a dissipative internal work component. And so the question is, how does that force evolve? When is it easier to go break a new fault, a new configuration, shift the system, uh, the system's organization completely, or when is it easier to just keep going um, as you started? So another way to, again, frame the same thing, but perhaps a little bit uh, of a simpler way, is to think about, well, how hard do I have to pull on a half grabbin to keep the half grabbin active? So again, the total force I need to exert has a term that's connected to the internal energy. Part of it is frictional dissipation on the fault. The other part is flexing the foot wall and hanging wall block. And part of it has to do with topography. That's the part that says topography. So we can write this as the amount of force I have to supply to the system, to the half grabbin, the normal fault, right, to keep it slipping, to keep it happy and to keep it going, as a function of increasing fault offset or fault keep. The red line marks the threshold for breaking a new fault. That's essentially a material property of that, the property of the crust. Let's say I broke a new fault. Um, my fault is weaker than the surrounding material, so I instinct instantaneously have a strength drop. But then as I accumulate offset on the fault, this energy term increases, so I have to supply more and more energy. I have to exert greater and greater force to increase the offset until I reach this breaking threshold where it's easier to break a new fault and then to continue slipping. That's including all three terms. That's this curve here. If I now remove all the topography, completely level it, build the basins, uh, cut off the mountain, then I actually strongly slow down this increase in force with increasing fault, uh, fault offset, and I will end up reaching this threshold for breaking the next fault much later. This is what's happening in about in a 25 kilometer thick perfectly elastogenic layer. But you can also do this for a 15 kilometer thick weaker layer, and that's a case where the relative effect of the topographic term relative to the rest of the dissipative term is greater. So removing it has a greater influence on the system overall. That's why you can go from a fault that would normally just go a couple kilometers and die to a fault that can live forever, essentially. So that's all well and good. That's kind of like a normal fault in a vacuum uh, with perfect surface processes that takes topography on or off. But the next question is, well, A, what's a realistic rheology, right? It's not just what is on earth a realistic efficiency for surface processes? Um, oops. What's a reasonable middle ground between leveling all topography and conserving all topography? And again, this goes back to the discussion we've been having and are going to continue to have over the next day, um, is what do we actually need from our landscape evolution models? What's uh, really important to capture? And that's something I'll get into with the example of drifting models. But what we set out to do is try to really understand what are the processes we needed to really capture mass redistribution and the right rates of mass redistribution in a half grabbin system? So we actually went out to beautiful scenic Idaho, famous for tomatoes. Um, this is in the Lemhi range. It's the northernmost uh, extent of the Basin Range. It has a bunch of really nice um, half grabbins where you can see um, clear localization on the master fault here. We're looking through this uh, profile. This is looking north of the Lemhi range. It has about one kilometer, again, of uh, topographic relief. The fault itself um, is thought to have accumulated as much as four kilometers um, of slip. And just from this topographic profile, you can kind of see the decaying topography away from the crest, which records a flexural uh, readjustment to fault slip. And right away, you can see something from the topography about the main ways that mass is redistributed at the surface. You can see these rivers that incise the foot wall block, drain material, deposit it um, pretty flat into this valley. It's a fine grain sediment, but remarkably flat. Um, some alluvial cones at the toe of the mountain. And if we actually go inside this canyon, look back at the hanging wall, we see um, pretty much the main mode mass is being stripped off the mountain and trans transported outward. Our fault is here. I'm here contributing to hill slope diffusion. This is um, the scree slopes of material basically falling from the mountain into um, the river, and the river just takes it up. This is this coupled system of getting material from the tops to the bottom of the valleys and then just flushing it out um, 
and in sizing the football pretty largely. So with this in mind, this is where the kind of landscape evolution formulation comes in. These are things that are typically, or that people try to capture, as we've discussed, with um, these types of formulations. We've now coupled our simple 2D quadratic model with a more, um, with a more complex landscape evolution model that incorporates the physical confusion, right? So this is all this mass uh, kind of falling into the rivers. Um, our tectonic uplift is not imposed in this case. It's fed by my tectonic simulation. I give the uh, vertical component of, um, of displacement to the landscape model, do a little bit step of landscape evolution, average it back and feed it to the tectonic solver again. And the stream power incision is really what we will focus on. Um, and the key parameter we'll play with is uh, K, irritability, although maybe K depends a little bit for kitchen sink because you could really put anything that you want in there. The proxy, you know, has to do with climate, has to do with erodibility, lithology, that degree of fracturing. But we won't get into that. I just want to try to do something fairly agnostic. Let's see if we can um, find realistic values of K, stick it in the model, and see if we get some response. See if we um, can be in a regime where our tectonic evolution is sensitive to, um, to surface processes. So that's the uh, model setup. It's not fully 3D. It's still using a 2D cross-sectional numerical models where faults evolved continuously. But again, what you do is you take the vertical component of displacement, extend it um, in and out of the page to infinity, so you can do your uh, landscape evolution in any view. Um, and once you've done your landscape evolution step, collapse back all this topography and feed it to the tectonic solver. So the tectonic solver only sees the kind of average load from the topography, average between crests and valleys. The other thing that I didn't mention is uh, we don't have a fully consistent rule for sediment transport and deposition yet. So for this, I will just infill all the subsidence areas. I assume that as soon as I create a pool, um, it's filled. You can think of that as um, perhaps that's not all material coming from the football. There could be material coming from other locations filling the, the lowlands. Um, but the question is what relevant landscape parameters can I put? Um, so one way to do this is to actually look at um, landscapes that you believe to be in some kind of steady state between uplift and erosion, and use the stream power framework to actually invert for um, some of these landscape parameters, and then simply stick them into the model. So this makes no assumption as to what K really means, for example. It's just saying, in that language, in the framework of that formulation, if I can read these parameters in real landscapes, then it's probably reasonable to try to see what the model's doing with them. It doesn't presume anything on what the meaning of these parameters are. So uh, the approach that I've chosen, called Chi analysis, is basically looking at river profiles um, in equilibrium. The idea being that if you look at an equilibrium river profile going up, upstream, you'll find this characteristic pointing shape. That reflects the competition of uplift and erosion, but it also, to a large extent, reflects the fact that as you move upwards, your drainage area, um, is reduced. So what um, Taylor Perron and Wiki Royden did is introduce the framework to correct for that. Um, it's based on a clever upstream integral of the steady state profile. I won't go into the details, but basically what you can do is transform your upstream distance coordinate into a chi coordinate. It's something that basically corrects for the fact that the drainage area changes as you move uh, upstream. So instead of plotting a profile of upstream distance and elevation, plot elevation versus this corrected uplift distance takes away the effect of drainage area. And the good thing with this is that the slope has to do with the competition of uplift and uh, erodibility. And that's a direct record of that. We did this for, again, the Lemai Fault in Idaho, using some rivers as an example from rivers in the football. Um, we plotted them with chi plot, so elevation above base level and um, chi. And assuming that we know the uplift, and really this is just an order of magnitude type of exercise, since we need to be frankly extremely precise, but there's of course lots of complexity to the method. The, the order of magnitude k that we get from this exercise, assuming an overall uplift rate in the football of 0.1 millimeter per year, would be of order 10 minus 5. That's very much in line with the values that were given this morning in the talk, so that's encouraging. But, um, and by the way, this was done with the Topo Toolbox suite of MATLAB tools, which is really useful. Um, and helpful suite of uh, uh, software to actually do this really easy 
we did this in Idaho. We also did this across a number of half grabbins from different rifts, uh, Rio Grande Rift and East African Rift. This is just to highlight the kind of natural variability you see in this slope of elevation versus sky, which remember reports the competition of uplift and erodibility. But that's not directly telling you about erodibility. It's just telling you that the natural systems, different half grabbins, span different um, degree of competition between erosion and uplift. But again, through a simple order of magnitude exercise, what you typically find are erodibility coefficients in the range of 10 minus 6 to 10 minus 4, uh, 10 minus 4 per year, regardless of what that actually means. And of course, there's lots of limitations with this approach, one being that we're only in the framework of stream power, that we ignore the spatial variability in uplift rates, and we have to assume that um, landscapes are in steady state. But it's a good place to start. So that's how we kind of try to calibrate the landscape part of the coupled model, try to fit to something that is reasonable and documented in nature. The other part of that is we also need some realistic rheological profiles for the upper crust and the lower crust. So rather than doing a perfectly elastoplastic brittle layer, now we incorporated a little bit more complex flow laws to describe creep in the lower crust. We use the wet part side flow law, um, which produces strength or peak stresses that are on par with what was inferred from failure to the pedometry in the Whipple Mountain flow complex. So that's a way of kind of constraining what you might think is a plausible strength and flow. And that's because strength modulates um, the degree of the feedback between surface processing mechanics that I was showing in the simpler model. So we really wanted to get this uh, to be a plausible strength profile. So here comes the fun part. These are the fully coupled models. I have three slides that are pretty much the same, just showing you the same outline. This is the uh, cross-sectional view of the tectonic model. You're looking at plastic strain, so that tells you where irrecoverable deformation is happening, tells you where faults form. We always start with a fault seeded. If you just start with a half carbon that's imposed and then look how it evolves. Um, we're pulling at a rate of uh, one millimeter per year on the sides. The black area is the brittle domain. The, the brownish area is the ductile domain that we creep in a distributed way. And here is a 3D view of the landscape evolution model, um, showing you the development of topography corresponding to um, the area shown right on the, so they're on the loop, but they basically show you how the fault grows, creates new topography. Here's the foot wall, here's the hand wall um, basin, and evolves through time with increasing amount of strength. So this is our reference case with erodibility of 10 minus seven, which is lower than anything that I've documented in the real systems, and no sedimentary input. If I have a basin in this case, I just let it grow. Um, as you can see here, there's a pretty good depression. And when I do that, my initial half grabbin quickly becomes extremely unhappy, and it wants to localize a new fault, in this case, to form a full grabbin after three kilometers of deformation. So that's the reference case. Let's keep the erodibility the same and just fill in the uh, basin and see what happens. In this case, what I'm adding is the, the, the code actually tracks the material that's being deposited as these yellow areas that fill the, uh, the hanging wall block. You're still developing sizable topography, almost a kilometer in the footwall. See, it's not very strongly incised by rivers, so the erodibility is still low. Um, but the topography now in the hanging wall is really flat because I force it to be that way. I just say, I have sediment up to that level. And in this case, my half grabbing is still not stable for very long. It's stable just a little bit longer. Instead of dying after three kilometers, it turns to a grabbing after now let's go to erodibility coefficients that are actually documented in the field. Um, 10 minus 6 per year in this, in this, uh, in this case, with the full sedimentary infill. And you can see here the river networks that, um, that incise progressively through the, through the foot wall. You can see the retreat of the, of the crest of the foot wall, the drainage divide. And you can see the thickening of the sedimentary um, basin as it goes. And in this case, the half grabbin is quite happy. It just keeps growing. Pretty similar result than what we had before, except this time we're doing it in much more realistic or at least plausible um, strength assumptions and landscape boundary conditions that can be to some degree calibrated um, in nature. And what the, uh, this new formulation also allows us to do is to really think about what controlled the behavior of the, of the model in relation to topographic growth. Here we're looking at the relief that developed as a function of increasing extension, relief in the range in the football block, so positive, and uh, basin relief, depth of the basin as it thickens. In all the runs that I've shown you before, going from super inefficient 
surface processes. That's no erosion, no infill. It's the blue line, so you start increasing the offset on the hull to create a foot wall that reaches about 600 meters of the reef, while you create a basin that's 200 meters. You do that over three kilometers of offset, and the star marks where um, the initial half gravity dies and continues to build up. If you slightly increase the efficiency of surface processes by filling the basin, you no longer get any topography uh, in the basin, it's all flat. But the foot wall still um, creates pretty sizable topography, that's the black line, and it terminates after four kilometers of sip. And as we get to more realistic K values, these are the ones that are documented in the field, this is where um, we see the half graben growing indefinitely and reaching a topographic steady state after a couple of kilometers of sip. So the fault is still growing and growing and growing, accumulating um, slips as large as eight, 10 kilometers, but the topography now no longer changes. And this is the case in the movie that I show you. We have another run with even more intense um, uh, erodibility and surface process reworking that just reaches topographic steady state quicker and at a lower level. So what that's telling you is perhaps it's really the topographic steady state and the timing to getting to topographic steady state that controls the dynamics of the system. And in the framework of the force balance, that's because as soon as you've reached steady state, um, well, you no longer need to spend any more energy on the system. You're done. Your whole topographic contribution is pretty much done. And what really matters is whether you can do this quickly relative to the time scales of the system, or if you do this slowly relative to the internal time scales of the system. I have two very quick slides on whether we can see fingerprints of this in, uh, in real systems. So I'll go through that pretty quickly. This is a compilation of topographic relief versus fault offset across uh, different half grabbins from the Bateman range um, and New Zealand. And what's interesting is that a lot of them seem to follow this uh, overall trajectory. If you had no erosion, right, the topographic relief would follow structural relief to some extent, like you get flexible rollovers and things like that. But in this case, there seems to be a pretty uniform trajectory, which is in line with what the models are predicting, telling us that in a lot of these systems, you do reach topographic steady state perhaps after a couple of kilometers of uh, extension. That's, of course, a little bit more complicated than that because you need to represent varying slip rates, varying ecologies, varying things like that. But that's an avenue to look at is to um, take different half grabbins and compare their um, evolution through time. Um, I'm going to conclude by kind of recapping what um, we've seen and try to generalize it to most systems. The first question that we need to ask is, is your tectonic system likely to be susceptible to reworking topography, regardless of what the surface processes are doing? Do right? you have a predisposition to being sensitive to uh, topography removal? And that's mainly controlled by um, how important, in relative sense, is that gravitational energy current relative to the overall dissipation of the system. So we could define some kind of uh, dimensionless numbers that describes the rate of increase in energy with increasing deformations really, um, related to topography only to the overall increase in energy with increasing extension related to dissipant processes. And um, that's a dimensionless number that would essentially tell you if you're able to remove all topography, this is how much you'd extend the lifespan of a single slip. And that's promoted in weaker crust because in weaker crust, the overall contribution to dissipative, flexural, frictional, um, energy terms become lower, and the relative share of the gravitational terms become higher, so you can have more impact. And finally, once you've established that your tectonic system is sensitive to topography, the question becomes, are realistic, uh, or at least Earth-documented rates of um, topographic reworking enough to do something on the relief so that it can be impacted? And then the time scales of interest become the um, time scale that, you, that it takes to reach topographic steady state as a function of erodibility um, and uplift, uh, sorry, erodibility and the width of the mountain in the framework of the force balance, relative to the internal time scale of what would be the lifespan of an average surface wall. So again, we could define a dimensionless number that has to do with localizing efficiency with weaker crust, slower tectonic rates, greater erodibility or faster deposition, um, favoring a high value of this number, which means enhanced local formation on faults, like we're seeing in all these numerical models, whether they're um, stationary wedge or rifts. So this is my conclusion slides. What do we need from coupled models? Well, my answer based on simply this would be, we need to really capture the time to topographic steady states and the rates of topographic buildup. Because once you get to topographic steady states, uh, 
So RG buildup no longer has an impact on the evolution of the system. But it's unclear to what extent the height and width of the actual steady state will have an influence on the system. And it's actually not clear how important it is to really reproduce the fine scale morphological features like triangular facets and like that. Uh, it might be important to get additional constraints on your landscape evolution model. It might not be critical for tectonics. One thing that we do need to discuss, um, but I've conveniently put it at the very last slide in my talk, is the effect of grid, sen uh, grid sensitivity to the pollution. The fact that if you refine your grid, you'll get smaller rivers that are less efficient at eroding the landscape. You get overall uh, longer times of steady state and greater relief. But overall, what's key is to use parameterizations in our coupled models that can be directly benchmarked and calibrated on real landscapes, just so we're sure that uh, we're not doing something too crazy, either taking too much mass or just not altering the topography enough. And that's something that we really need to take into uh, other processes like fluvial incision, hill slopes, glacial erosion, both threshold effects, semi-tunnel effects, and especially sediment transport in the region. So, lots to be done. Thanks. So, we're going to take some questions. Okay, uh, Patricia. Very nice presentation. Thank you. I'm Patricia Prasad from Louisiana State University. Um, you show the, the effect of sedimentation on um, localization. Um, do you consider the effect that fluids would have on this? That, that what, sorry? Fluids. Fluids. As because with, with, with higher sedimentation or bringing sediments against the fault zone, you would increase fluid. What do you mean by fluids? So fluids, water. On the so you would have you would you would make it easier to slip on the fault zone. So you're talking about fluids inside the crust. Yes. Ah, okay. So you could think that in those systems when you're accreting a lot of sediment, you're actually building the crust as you go. You're accreting a large part of the crust that has sediment property, perhaps just high porosity, and changing the properties of the crust. Um, and you're right that that might do two things that might help fluids percolate into the system, change the effective stresses on the fault. But on the other hand, you're also increasing the burden you're putting on the fault. You could increase the strength of the fault. So uh, anything's possible, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I could, um, Cindy Eppinger, I, thanks so much for you know, uh, paring this down to the essential physics for driving the processes. And, and but given the nature of the meeting and the way that you bring the communities together, I wondered if you could share with the group here where your tectonic models have strong fits with real observations, say the time sequence of strain distribution um, and versus uh, and where there are, are large misfits, maybe other aspects of the process that we're not understanding. and, and in, Specifically, you know, taking a half robin model, a flexural model, is the crustal strain, the crustal thickness variation is consistent, and is the time evolution fault system yep. consistent with that tectonic part? What do we know? What don't we know very well when you compare your models with true observation? Probably just going to answer a fraction of that because there's still be a lot to talk about. But there are the cool thing with working with half robins is, like you said, there's many observables that change the strain. So one of them being the wavelength of flexure. That is something that we do reproduce fairly well. The fact that topography would decay over a, a roughly 20 kilometer wavelength is something that's seen um, in corn thrift, it's seen in basin and range, it's seen, it's seen in, a long, in a number of places. That's a measure of integrated strength um, from the crust from a flexural perspective. You could also look at here the degree of strain localization. You can see this kind of secondary faults that do exist but never take over. And if you think of half-grabbins in the East African Rift, for example, there's these classic studies of how much strain being taken up on the master fault, maybe 50%, the rest being partitioned into the hanging wall. That's something we do see to some extent here. We do see a lot of little secondary faults that never quite but win. That, what you've shown doesn't match. I mean, you just said the East African Rift, but that won't match the landscape of the pattern. And, that, and it, I mean, that's okay because scale, but when you actually look at dimensions and other aspects, it doesn't. And, and I, I, that's not the, the point that I was trying to make. It's, it's about the detailed comparison and how we're benchmarking. How are we going to work forward 
to evaluate what parts we know well and what we don't and what data sets to use here today, like the questions yeah, yeah. we had this morning. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you made detailed comparisons with the particular basins. And I, the, re the reason I want to caution a tiny bit is that I saw in some of your diagrams that you've taken topography, say, from the ruins or east, where there are two faults on both sides and a glacier on the top. Yes. And, and there are multiple processes to be taking care in the way that we benchmark and we compare observations is going to be really important to teasing out That's and absolutely the, true. the coupling right. between these two processes. So, I, um, you know, and you've gone so far, but can we, you know, can we do some of these benchmarking, uh, not benchmarking exercises, but actually calibration exercises um, to really help us move forward? But at some point, the together. choice has to be made, right? How much do you want to fit? So my take is, it's, it's the approach I've taken is to really fit the first order integrated proxies, like spectral wavelength as a proxy for spectral rigidity, the overall um, average relief that you get, the degree of strain localization and the amount of offset you could accumulate on a fault. And perhaps the pattern of where the next fault break might be another thing to consider for this assessment. Whether I could or should push it to a finer detail, maybe not, maybe not, definitely not at this stage. But yeah, that's the, we must be having this discussion for tectonics in the same way we're having it for landscape evolution. Uh, yes, hello, Paul Eisner from the University of Pittsburgh. And um, I was uh, quite impressed by your tectonic model. And one thing I wanted to ask um, is how much you consider the horizontal uh, displacement component. Because you're in an extensive setting. And uh, in your surface model, I saw your input is up and down. And you reach very easily steady state, but up and down. Yeah. Like what if you have the horizontal? That's a great point. I didn't talk about it, but it's there. So the lateral advection is there. You can see this fault actually migrate, uh, migrating and rotating a little bit. Part of the retreat of the crest is actually due to that effect. The whole fault is moving and retreating. So I'm not just feeding the vertical component. I'm also advecting the landscape and stretching the landscape, which is something that a lot of uh, landscape evolution models don't do, but it's hard to keep track of on the grid horizontal setting. That is there. And so you're right. The, Topographic steady state is mainly in a vertical sense, but um, at some point, the river profiles on either end do tend to balance each other out, and you do get to a steady state also in, with respect to lateral, lateral variation. So yeah, it's, it's in there. Okay, thank you, uh, Jean-Claude. Let's thank Jean-Claude once again. We're gonna go on.